Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the first question here. Um, I believe many of you got through the first question and most of you I think got all the way up through the third question. I'm gonna go over a couple things in here. First, of course, we'll go over the answers, but we're also gonna go over how the scoring guidelines work and how that kind of affects how the test is gonna be scored. Now, all that being said, there's a solid chance that the scoring is gonna be very different this year because of the, the way the tests were completed and turned in. I would say they're probably going to be more lenient um, and give everybody the benefit of the doubt because they're going to want to show success. They're not want to. They're not going to want to show. Oh, look! Everybody failed the AP test. Yay! This was such a good success. No, they're going to want to at least match what they've done in the past, if not show you know a, a higher success rate, uh, so they have less complaints. So let's take a look at the first question here. When you approach an AP question, you should go through and just peruse it and take a look at it and see what's in there. Anything that is commented is important. They tell you that this is a list of all cookie orders. We know we should recognize that it is an array list. Um, so, but they didn't use the word array list. Remember we discussed this before when we talked about how the AP exam uses list as the interface and just implements that interface in array list. So you're gonna see the word list as the type often, but really for our purposes, it's not going to have much of a difference in any of the methods. We're just gonna use the same methods that we normally use for array list. And then you can see down here, they have a new method that sets up an array list. Then they have um, something that adds an order. They also do this thing where they talk about what it does and um, the parameters that are expected. So that's listed for you. And then they also talk about anything that's supposed to be returned. So this descriptor piece is really important. This last one says all the cookie orders from the master order have the same variety and it's gonna return the total number of boxes. So it's, again, it's going through everything it needs to be completed in the example. You'll also notice that it tells you essentially right there what you're gonna be doing. You're gonna be implementing this method in part A. You're gonna be implementing this method in part B. They also put this nice little caveat right here that says there may be other code that we're just choosing not to show you. So they may use a method or introduce a method and not give you the code for it. When they do that, just assume the method works as stated and you are aware of what it returns. So let's look at part A. The goal here is to get the total number of boxes and to do that, we're going to have to go through the array list. There are two ways of going through the array list. You could go through the array list using a for loop. So, you know, if you remember, we have our for loop looks like this. And we would go through our nice little array list. But we could also go through it using a for each loop. Now, the answer I'm going to show you goes through using a for each loop. The for each loop is part of the testable content. So you will see this structure on the AP exam. So just make sure you understand what it says. So it's the way this is read is it's for each variable of type type in array. So this VAR is going to take on every single element in the array array. Then we just have to get access to the total number of boxes for each element. So if we th look at our structure up here, We have an array list called orders. 
and it is a array list of type cookie order. So we need to know something about cookie order to get the different varieties. Do they tell you? So you can also scroll down and take a look at some of the other methods that they have in other parts of the question. They're not, you're not limited to being stuck in just that one spot. So the method that we have access to is add an order. And then we also have access to get variety. So when you do this loop, it should end up looking like this. Let me see if I can make this bigger because you probably can't see this. So are we allowed to use like Dr. Johan doing this FRQ since we can use them on the actual AP test? Absolutely, 100%. Now they say in their direction that you don't need Dr. Java. That's very similar to them saying on the SAT, you don't need a graphing calculator. Okay, so you pretty, pretty much do. Uh, I, I would assume so. Um, I mean, I can't, uh, when you're taking the test, and I think they're supposed to put out, they should have sent out an email yesterday, but they didn't, with a trial version of the test, so you can kind of sign in and see what it looks like. I would even suggest having more than one computer up, one to run a development environment, just to kind of keep it separate from the test so that way you're not gonna have an issue with screens crashing or anything like that. And I know the school laptops are pretty small, so if you have access to another computer to at least run the development environment on, that would be good. Um, they're not limiting you in anything you can look up. You can look up anything you want, but the way they put it is it's not something you can Google. So because of the time limit, by the time you finish trying to Google the answer, it's gonna be over, the, the test will be done. Does that make sense? So in here, they're using a for each loop. So for each cookie order, C being the order, we're gonna get the variety and we're gonna see if it equals the variety that we're interested in. And if it does, then we're gonna add the value returned by get number of boxes. So this is a really kind of ugly, complicated statement. And if you wanted to break it down and use other variables, you could, the AP exam would not you know, fault you for that. But one of the things I wanted to point out, which is really interesting, is for the entire part A of the question, this is it. This is all the code you have to write. Yeah, I was kind of put off by that. They're not asking you to write a whole lot of code. I mean, I guess that's good since it's only like 45 minutes long. Yes, it's also, um, don't be intimidated by the answers because the way they wrote these codes is they wrote it in the most elegant, efficient way possible. You don't have to be elegant or efficient at all. You can just write the answer and go from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, but like there's not really that much room for leeway here. I think that's actually exactly what I wrote. Okay, cool. I'm not sure if I, I don't, I, no, I didn't, I use different variable names, but like the basic structure that's pretty much the only answer unless you use a different kind of for loop. Right, you could use just a regular for loop when you go through it. And either one would actually be correct. You could use the for each loop or use a regular for loop. The only reason I didn't use a normal for loop is because I remembered saying that you could usually use for each loop with array lists. Yes, it's just because it's easier. Removing, but... It's definitely easier to code. Okay, that's part A. So part B, you have to assume that even if you wrote part A incorrectly, even if you left it blank, Assume you now have access to the method get total boxes. Assume it works when you're doing part B. 
So here, we're going to implement the remove variety method and update the master order by removing all of the cookie orders in which the variety of cookie matches the parameter cookie variable. The master order may contain zero or more cookies with the same variety as cookie var. The method returns the total number of boxes removed from the master order. And here's an example. So these examples are really important. You have to make sure your code will process these examples properly. So they're going to add an order. They're going to use the new constructor to construct a new cookie order. So they're adding an order to goodies, which is a new master order. They're going to add in their chocolate chip, their shortbread, and they're putting in each amount. So you have to make sure yours is going to work. And after the code segment is executed, this should be the contents of master order. When you call dot remove variety chocolate chip, it needs to go through all of the orders in goodies, check the type, and if the type is chocolate chip, it needs to remove it from the array list. So it's nice that we're using an array list. So if we move, remove brownie, it returns a zero because there are no brownies in our list. And then they ask you to write the code. Does that make sense? So again, I think I had the solution on the same screen. Hang on. There it is. Make this bigger again. Okay, so here is where we're creating our master order. We can see that that's there. And then here's our remove. Now again, you may not do it the same way. You may choose to do it differently. What does the first line under the while loop say? Can't this? What the method is. Cookie order, C? No, some dot. It's, it, I can't read where that. This? What the met, no. Where it does say cookie, cookie order C equals what? What is it? Oh, mean? okay. I don't know what. So they created this thing called a list iterator. And we didn't go over that method. We didn't go over that class. It's not part of the AP set. So they're just going through and doing the solution a different way. You could be using a for loop here or a for each loop. Does that make sense? So th this is one of the things I wanted to show you is that as you guys are looking for these solutions online, you may come across people's unique solutions. And this is one of those where they use something called a list iterator. Is that like turning a while loop into a for loop kind of? This? No. Um, it, it takes out the, the need to know how many items are in the list. Oh, okay. But so does a for each loop. So I would have done this. I wouldn't have done any of this. I would have just said, created another for each loop and gone through every single order in um, master orders. Check the variety, see if it equals the variety. If it does, um, then we need to remove it. We also, they're doing a plus equals. Shouldn't that be a minus equals? Um, oh, they're returning, it's, no, it's the amount that's- Oh, how many they've removed? Yeah, I did a plus equal. Right, it's how many they've removed, got it. Okay. So that's the first question. What I think is really important to see after doing that is to see how they grade it. I don't, did I ever show this to you guys? I don't think so. Okay, so these are the things that, that cause no errors whatsoever. These are the things that are half point errors, and these are major errors. So these are in addition to any other errors that are specifically listed in the question. However, most often, 
they're only looking at to add points when they talk about going through the question. These are really the only things you can lose points for. So, yeah, if we go through these, first off, if you spell something wrong or have the wrong case, lowercase instead of uppercase or uppercase instead of lowercase, as long as it's clear, they won't penalize you for it. There's no penalty. Um, sorry, I was just looking at my email real quick. Uh, if the local variable is not declared, if others are declared in some part. So if you mess up the local declaration, you forgot to declare it, but it's clear. Uh, use the keyword as an identifier. You accidentally used a, a method or a um, property that you didn't know was a keyword as a variable in your code. They won't penalize you for that. The use of brackets versus parentheses versus less than greater than. No penalty for that equals versus equals equals and vice versa as long as it doesn't change the meaning it's fine so all that would fail inside of dr java so this is where that compiler could cause you issues because in the compiler when you're running it while you're taking the test it has to work perfectly whereas in the exam you're not actually running it it doesn't have to work there could be, it could be riddled with errors but and still get full credit so you might want to think about whether or not you actually want to run a compiler and run the whole thing you might want to use it just just to double check a command or just to double check um a structure but i wouldn't be putting your entire answer into the compiler and running it to see if it works so you just have to have the right idea basically yes and like the right structure yeah not really the right structure like the basic yeah. Like mm -hmm. have no brackets on the for loop or whatever. Um, well, missing missing parentheses is fine. Missing parentheses around if and while conditions. Missing semicolons. Oh. Like they oh, really no. get let you get away with a lot. Wait, so you can just like use the the no brackets for loop? Yeah. Like in Python. Yeah, you can almost write it in Python-esque as long as it's clear to the grader. Because you have to remember, in in the exam world, the goal here is to make it language independent. So. Oh yeah, it's supposed to be. It, this is just object-oriented. Yeah, it's just object-oriented programming, and Java's the vehicle. That's all. So these are like you got this whole list here. You can see it's like a whole bunch of things that you can do, and I'll send you guys the links for these. Um, let me just pop it in the chat if that's okay. And when I post the video, I'll post the links for these. Okay. Minor errors, half a point errors, confused len for length. So now we're starting to get some errors. This is kind of important using len versus length, missing a new command in the constructor, modifying something that was declared as final, accidentally using equals or dot equals on a primitive. And vice versa, using equals equals for an object. That will also cause an error. Um, array collection, um, not using the brackets properly. Assignment dyslexia, that should be obvious what you're doing there. Well, yeah, that was math, but not, not yeah, exactly. Uh, making sure you use super dot method as opposed to super parentheses method. I don't even know why they have that in there because um, that would be bizarre, but other languages do that structure. So they're making sure you're using the dot method. So nobody should make that mistake because we've never done it. Um, formal parameter syntax with the type. Uh, missing public from a method header when required. Now, most cases you won't be writing method headers. As you saw in those that first problem, they gave you everything. You're just writing, the, implementing the, the method. Uh, using null with quotes instead of null without quotes. Uh, true or false or a zero one for Boolean values. So like all kinds of little things like that. Half a point minor errors. Uh, a minor error that occurs exactly once um, is regarded as an oversight and not, cur and not counted. It, it is penalized if it is only the instance one or two occurs or two or more times. 
So like you're not going to get hit for half a point error every time if you keep making the same mistake. Wait, so if you get it right two times and you do a minor error, it doesn't even count as an error anymore? Um, no. A minor error that occurs exactly once when the same concept is correct two or more times is regarded as an oversight and not a, a not penalized. Was it, is it within one question or is the entire test? I'm not sure. Um, so if, it's within, if it's within the entire test, that could be actually really good for saving time. Like if you leave up a public... Uh, no, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I think what they mean is like you're you're being consistent. They're not going to bang you for a half point every time you make the mistake. I be, that's the way I've interpreted it in the past. But like again, I can't see individual student papers with grades on them, so I don't know. But that's the way I've interpreted it. Uh, major errors, extra code that causes a side effect. Now you're you don't get penalized for having extra code. You get penalized for having extra code that causes problems in the solution. Uh, an interface or class instead of a variable identifier. So using the class name, you know, if it's static, then you can use the class name. But if it's not static, you have to make sure you're using the object's name rather than the class name. Uh, here's another example of it. Attempt to use private data. That's a big no-no. Destruction of persistent data, in other words, changing the value reference by a parameter. Um, use class name in place of super in the constructor call. So that's a big one. We have to be careful of that. I know we, you know, when we went over that, that was actually a change in Java. So uh, you might find this in some places on the internet, but you need to use the word super when referring to the constructor of a parent. You cannot use the name of the class. And then void method returns a value. If you say it's void, it has to be void. Is that the other way around too? If you have a return value and it returns something? Or return the wrong thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if it's, if it's a return, if, it, like, if you have a string return but doesn't return anything? If you have a string return, yeah, correct. You'll get a point also, off. Also, will they take points off if you have an unreachable statement, like an unreachable return or method? That'll be in. That'll be on the individual question. That won't be marked that way up there. Wouldn't that be counted as extraneous code with no side effects, though? Because it doesn't do anything. I, I'm. I don't know. Maybe. It depends on the, the context. Alan, we're going to turn off your camera if you're not behaving. All right, so um, consider all the, if we look at this, this is the grading scoring guideline. So this is what they give to the graders, and each grader only grades one part of a question. So they look at this, and they know this really, really well. And they're real solid about doing these kinds of things. But I want you to notice, do you see any minuses? No. It's all pluses. So when you think about doing these questions, you need to think about doing them in terms of how many points can I gather, not do I have the correct answer. So if you look at Considers cookie order objects in this dot orders. So, like, returning the, the total is only half a point? Yes, exactly. It's the most important part of the method. Yeah, but it's not. They want to see that not you've accessed any element of this dot orders, a half a point. Accessing all of the elements with no out of bounds access potential, then it's a half point. So, if you use a for each loop and go through every element, you got a point. If you are correctly cor calculating the total number of boxes, it's worth one and a half points, but then they break it down. Invokes the get number boxes on an object of type cookie order. Creates an accumulator. and So just for saying int sum equals zero, you got a half a point. Even if you don't do anything, yep. it's still a point? St it's still a half a point. Creates an accumulator. Yeah. If you so, just create it, uh -huh. and then you don't even add. You just right. call and get num boxes. It doesn't, you still get points. You still get your half a point. Correct. So 
think about as you're answering these questions, and this is why reasons why it's important for us to go over this, not just for the answers. The answers you guys can look up. It's more about understanding how they grade these things. So you are trying to gather as many points as possible. Do something in the question. If you see an array list that's part of the question, write a for loop and you're gonna get some points. Uh, take a look at this one. This is part B and they have a total of six points, but then they have some special minuses. Consistently refers to the incorrect name instead of orders. Consistently references incorrect name instead of orders. So in other words, they use master order or this. So it's about consistency. If you do it once, then they're not gonna worry about it. But if you constantly do it, then they're gonna subtract a point. Um, and if you have the incorrect type, then it's minus one and a half. It won't be both of these. It's one or the other. Uh, again, we can look. Everything else here is plus. Look at the things that they're giving you points for. Use the for loop and access the elements. Access to an element. Not, not even all of them. Just got one of them. Does a comparison to check to see if um, you're using a dot equals or dot compare to. Compares the parameter of cookie value get variety. Removes an element from this dot orders. So even if you totally incorrectly use the method of dot remove, you still get a half point. It doesn't say correctly removes, it just says removes an element. Removes only matching objects. So there's the other side of that, there's the other half a point. Removes all matching objects with no elements skipped. So that's you know an important point of that. Part two, one and a half points. Again, they divide this out. Correctly puts in an accumulator. Int sum equals zero, half a point. Add a six. I mean, think about the the percentage of that, right? It's one twelfth of the question. One twelfth of the points is for just saying int sum equals zero. The whole question here is worth nine points. You get a one point in both half a point in both parts, one point total. So one ninth of the question is doing int sum equals zero. You get a half point for putting a plus sum and an equal sum. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you do. Correct. So if you approach a question and you feel overwhelmed and you're not sure how to answer it, because you only get two questions. You only get two. Yes, just vomit on the computer. Maybe not literally, but like, you know, get as much down as you possibly can. Okay. Yes, it is the exact English. It has to make sense in computer science. You're that's not the way it works. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the next question. Going back to my beach for a minute. Here, I thought I was going to impress all of you by having my wonderful screen transitions, but you know, I was already shown up by the talking cheeseburger. So, you know, what are you going to do? All right. Question two. Uh, we're going to make a line. All right. There is no assumption that you know algebra. So they go through and they explain all of those things. Read it anyway, but it's going to match algebra. Okay. They gave you the equation. They gave you the equation for slope. They want you to check to see whether or not it's a point is on the line. Yes, because it works. No, because it doesn't work. So they told you how to do all the math. You still don't know what you need to do for the question. You're just going through and seeing what the method, what the um, class does. This is how we create a new line. This is how we um, get the slope. There's a method called get slope. They tell us what it's going to be returned. This is how uh, we check to see if a point is on a line. And then there's another example. So you have to write the whole class. That's it. They gave you nothing else. So this is where that open notes thing is going to come in handy. What do you think is one of the things you should have in your notes? Maybe the basic structure of a class. Have that listed written down for you so you can kind of almost follow a formula. 
you're almost guaranteed to have to write a total class from start to finish. So if you write down in your notes all of the things that you need to have in a class and you almost have a checklist of things that you go through, then you're going to be ready to write this class. So without much more ado, let's look at the answers for this. Okay, uh, don't worry about the package thing. That's a development environment thing, but they have properly identified the class. The header's correct. I have my private data. I have a constructor. I properly assign using the this operator. Now, if you use different variable names for these, maybe this was XYZ and this was ABC, you would not need the this operator. They need the this operator because they chose the same variable names. I have a method that gets slope. I even, I almost think this question is easier than the other one because you're kind of just doing it all. You know, sometimes I think it's easier to do the whole thing. I just tell you exactly what to do. Can you kind of just copy the formula into a method and return it? Pretty much. You just have to make sure you return the right types. Okay. Make sure you're doing your type casting as needed. Be careful of these kinds of errors. This is integer division without this casting right here. So we got can it. Can I cast B and have it still work? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they don't care. Uh, that's what I did. I know it works. So yeah, it won't matter. No, because I was like, if you make the A negative and cast the B, then you won't need that first one. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was just a single one. Cool. Uh, don't try to get fancy, though. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? It's great that you're doing that. We're sledgehammering this. If Just go as brute force as you can, making sure it works. If you think it's you're doing something that with some finesse, but you're not 100% sure of it, I'm not saying that you weren't. But if you're not 100% sure of what you're doing, forget the finesse, do it with brute force. Uh, another Boolean is, is on the line. You're just calculating AX plus BX plus C to see if it equals the value. And they, again, they got a little fancy. They're returning the result of computed equals equals zero, which is a Boolean operation in itself. So they're just returning the result of that Boolean operation. You don't have to be fancy. You could just return true, else return false. So if computed equals blah, 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 return true, else return false. You mean the else? Uh, well, yeah, you could say return true and then just put return okay, false. Return yep, exactly. Okay, yeah. Correct. But again, you don't have to do that. You could be brute okay, force. Anyway. Yeah. No, I, I, the brute force answer to this that requires no finesse whatsoever would be if um, A star X plus B star Y plus C equals equals zero, return true else return false. Now we know there's better ways of writing that, but that's the brute force way of it. Put the calculation equals equals zero and turn that, right? Yeah, they're returning the result of this calculation, which is a Boolean result. You don't even, really, you don't even have to make a variable, do you? I don't think you could put this here. Can't you just try to uh -uh. Get back? I don't think you can do a calculation before you do a comparison, and you can't put the zero first. I think you need to do this, okay. and this is and this is where that idea of finesse comes in, right? You know, if you have a question of whether or not something's going to be legitimate and legal, don't do it. Do it with the sledgehammer. Forget the finesse. So basically, we're just throwing away everything you told us. At the time. <laughs> You're going to suspend being a good programmer at this point and switch to the mode of good test taker. <laughs> I, I think I said this at the beginning of the year. This is the AP course, so I have to teach you how to take the test. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's separate from becoming a good programmer. It just means that those two aren't always parallel. You know, there, there are, like I said, 
you can get a point for saying int sum equals zero, but that doesn't mean it's gonna work. Yeah, I feel like in being a zip program, there are definitely some subtraction points. Yeah, no, they're not subtracting points for being a, from being a, a lazy programmer, not at all. And then finally, uh, question three, but you guys are only gonna have question, two questions, but you know, here's the third question. Again, they give you data, pieces of information. I won't go through all of that. I'm sure you guys read it all. Here, they got a class. You have to write two unrelated methods of trail. So you're implementing the methods. They tell you the preconditions. They tell you um, where it's to be implemented. The thing you have to be careful with these questions is to make sure they're not also implementing an interface. So for example, if this method also implemented an interface, you'd have to make sure, or this class implemented an interface, you have to make sure you would include all of those additional methods. So you just, just have to watch out for that. And then part A, here it is. They just make sure you implement this method, is level trail segment, that's it. So we look up here, is level trail seg segment, and then we can look at the pre and post conditions. Precondition, you get a value. Um, for start and end and markers, return true. You know it's going to return a Boolean true. Start is the index of the starting marker. End is the index of the ending marker. And then they tell you, you know, the, the values. But for start, it's got to be greater than or equal to zero. And end's got to be greater than start. So you don't have to worry about testing those things. Anything they tell you is a precondition, you don't have to verify it. There's no um, dummy checking in here. You know, you don't have to make sure that the user's using it properly. You just assume that if this precondition is true and you don't have to worry about it. And then that's part A. And then part B, surprise, surprise, they're gonna have you write the method is difficult. And they're basing it upon elevation change. If, if this trail is difficult, rated by counting the number of changes in the elevation that are at least 30 meters up or 30 meters down. So they're gonna make you go through some kind of loop here that traverses through the array. So let's take a look at the answer. I got the, the screen set to 400, so 400% view, so I can't find it. Here we go. Okay, so here's our answer. Here's the trail path, start and end, make a high and a low, and they're just doing a for loop. And we've done kind of this algorithm before where we set mins and maxes to highs and lows, so this shouldn't be that different. They're using an absolute value. If you forgot to import the math, well, that's okay because you're just writing the methods. You gotta assume that somebody did that properly earlier. So you can have access to all those built-in methods without having to worry about importing them earlier in the code. Uh, I don't remember that math min and max thing. Yeah. I had to look up like I, I didn't really remember what the the searching for min and max was, so I looked it up. I didn't like copy paste the code. I just wanted a reminder. Yeah, that's fine. But you're gonna have be, you're gonna be able to do that on the AP exam. Yeah, you know, brute force. Yeah, absolutely. I can just wait. Can you just copy and paste code? No, I'm sure they will have that blocked. I'm, that's why I, like, I almost, almost encourage you to use a separate computer so you're not tempted to do that. But um, there are ways of blocking in browsers the ability to copy and paste code. You won't even be able to copy the question. You can copy and paste it on your other computer. No, you, if, no. you're only going to be able to log into the test once. No, I mean, no, like I can copy and paste it into Dr. Java. You can't copy their code from the question and put it into Dr. Java would be my guess what I'm saying is for test security. An answer, you can put it in Dr. Java with your other code. To test it, yeah. Test yeah. Yes, but you you can't copy it from there. You'd have to type it in. I, you'd have to copy it. But you could also take, they're allowing you to handwrite it and take pictures. Really? Yeah. You just got to make sure you you handwrite it well, and 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 take a good picture of it. So, I'm not, I'm not kind of I can't write 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would type it, but like, there is some advantage to handwriting it because, again, you you kind of play on that idea of sledgehammer. Yeah, sledgehammer, and whether or not they're gonna give you credit. You know, if they look at it and they're like, yeah, that kind of looks right. Yeah, it could be that was a meant to be tabbed in. You know, it's harder to, to fake those things when you type it. So, like, um, if you're, like, doing the exam in a compiler, you got to, like, leave time to, like, manually type it into the response? Correct, which is why I'm encouraging you not to try to compile your entire code. Do not try to run and compile your answer because... You see this whole here thing here right here? One, I may not have access to all the code for every method that they're using. So I probably can't even run it. Two, I'm not gonna be able to copy and paste code from the question and put it into a compiler. That is going to be blocked. All copy and paste functions from the test. Now they haven't said this, but I'm promising you all copy and paste functions from the test will be blocked. So I won't be able to do this and hit copy and then go over and paste it somewhere. That's not going to work. It's just going to let me highlight it, but I'm not going to be able to copy and paste it. None of this is going to work. Okay. They may even totally disable right click. Make sense? Yep. You're going to get, um, I believe, a certain amount of time to read in quotes, the question, slash read it, do it, and then five minutes to submit it. And then that'll be it. If you screw it up, there's round two in June. That's why we're encouraging you to do the first round. Don't say, oh, I'm going to wait till June and just do the second round of testing. Do the first round. Because if you have a technical issue or something isn't working right or the power goes out at your house, like it could happen today, right? Um, if you have a screaming kid in the back and you can't concentrate, you can go ahead and retake it in June, which is unprecedented for the AP exam that you have a retake. Make sense? It will be different questions, but you could definitely have a retake. Okay, so those are all of the answers for all three. And I didn't go through all of the, the grading for all three, but I can send that link to you. Um, there's one more link that I'm going to send to you as well. This website right here has all of the free response questions from 2011 up to 2019. Now, one of the reasons why they don't include the 2010 is because 2010 used to also include another part of the exam called Grid World, which was a, a class that you had to study before you took the test and understand how it worked. So they eliminated that from the exam in 2010. So 2011 on is, is safe. You're not going to have any Grid World questions. So that's why I kind of assigned us 2010 because I could kind of control what we did. And then 2011 through 2019, not much has changed. The test is pretty much the same. So you have a wealth of practice problems to take a look at. You don't clearly don't have to do them all. Um, but if you're serious about taking the AP test, I would spend some time going through these, trying them, looking at the answers. Uh, they'll all be posted. They also, in this case, also gave you Java files that are partially completed that you could go ahead and complete and then run to to verify that it works. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's all I wanted to go over with you. I'm going to stop the video and leave that out there for you guys and then we can chat and see if there's any questions.